What's due today? We're due. 20 samples. Yeah, that's due, and I'd like to give you some time on it. But, I have to have you notes then first, which would mean you are actually coming to class on time, doing your thing, letting a teacher go to the bathroom without having to come back and get mad. It would be lovely. Poor door. Didn't do anything. Still there, brother, though. quickly finish the rest of the notes. You can have the rest of the class food to finish up your worksheet. Sheets with an S. Some people didn't turn in their one that we thought we wrapped up a couple days ago, but whatever. whatever. And then you can work on your homework. There's lots of things you could do. You can just help me get through this without losing my bananas. I appreciate that. Okay, so first thing first. We were talking about experimental design. Were there any questions up till here? Okay. And then we have three basic principles, which you are supposed to know. And I am assume you already knew one of them. You already knew that there was supposed to be some sort of random assignment. We've already talked about why you might want to have a control group to account for those lurking variables. And then the last thing is replication. And the reason you want replication is because you want to know if it just, if we did an experiment with table one, was that by chance? Or if we did it with table one, two, three, four, five, six, if we ran the experiment lots of times and got the same results, then we could, they'd be a little more believable. Okay, experiments and what can go wrong. The response to a dummy treatment is called the placebo effect. In a single blind experiment, either the subjects or the individuals interacting with the subjects don't know which treatment they are receiving, which we discussed yesterday. Uh, double blind, so I, again, I'm giving the drugs. I don't know what Sally's getting. Sally doesn't know what Sally's getting. Only the people back at the lab know all the things. So example five, in an interesting experiment, researchers examined the effect of an ultrasound on birth weight. Pregnant women participating in the study were randomly assigned to one of the groups. The first group of women received an ultrasound. The second group did not. When the subject's babies were born, their birth weights were recorded. The women who received the ultrasounds had heavier babies. Okay, so did the experiment experimental design take the placebo effect into the account? Why is this important? Louise, you're going to stop and you're going to do notes now because you're going to make me happy because you told Shalia to lock the door and she did because she's apparently incompetent too. Excellent. Because I would like to go back to being happy. Yes, dear. Can there be a placebo in the experiment where it's not like a pill being given? Absolutely. But how is that, the hell the placebo effect work? Right? Because, I mean, it's, they would you can't talk. change the weight of the baby. If they do the placebo, they will probably go through the motions of the ultrasound, but not actually do it. Oh, okay. Without I mean, the mother somehow knowing, because I don't know how that would work. I mean, they have to go through and put the picture up of the baby. I just don't so. see how the placebo effect could be in that experiment. So I don't think so. And then, so did the, the experimental take the placebo effect into account? You're saying no because women didn't receive a fake ultrasound. I mean, I didn't say they did, so... This is the first example where I actually have a little experience, sadly enough. And no, they like, as they move, you see the baby move on screen. So I don't see how they could fake that that well. Okay, but is there an issue with their experiment because they didn't take the placebo effect into account? And then there's something else I'm thinking placebo-wise. It's not just this whole fake ultrasound thing. They didn't really have a control group, did they? 
Well, I guess the women who didn't receive an ultrasound would technically be their control. Okay. There's so many lurking variables in society. Yeah, I don't like this experiment. Well, there's one other thing I don't, well, what they don't tell us that I wonder, so I'm with Sally with this fake ultrasound, but I also wonder um, if there was no placebo effect because, or maybe there was a placebo effect, what did they tell the women? I want to know what exactly they said to the women. Did they say, hey, we're not going to let you have ultrasounds and you're going to have a kid with heavier birth weight or whatever? Well, they can't control so how heavy the kid is going to be. No, but they can influence the woman's opinion on how heavy her kid should be and that might influence her eating habits. If they implied to me, like when I read that question, I was like, oh God, is ultrasound affecting my baby's birth weight? So if they implied to me that I'm going to have a, a skinnier baby because I've gotten ultrasounds, I would probably believe it. And then maybe my eating habits and my other life choices would eventually cause my baby to have a lower well, we don't birth weight. Them, so. We don't know what they told them. So that's another thing we could write about. Uh, let's move on to the next one. Was the experiment double blind and why is this important? It was, and how do we know it was single blind? Because the person giving the ultrasound knew they were giving the ultrasounds. Okay, so not I mean, double blind. Do women know they're giving an ultrasound? You they have to know. The was. Yeah, they don't know okay. what these. I don't think they knew what they were looking for. Okay. Because, um, person giving ultrasounds. Okay, but could it be double blind? Because the person might just be doing their normal job. Like, I give ultrasounds all day long. I don't know that this is part of an experiment. Like, I'm just doing my normal ultrasound. Are you supposed to think that much into it then? I don't know. Does I mean, it hurt? I think it could be, but well, I think a lot of it probably wouldn't be. Oh, well, yeah. I feel like all of it's just... As long as you justify your answer, I feel like you could get it right. That's how I felt this whole year. As long as you justify it and use your words, life's good. Yes, dear? Okay, so not double blind because the person giving ultrasound could be aware of the So while I get we can't necessarily I'm with Olivia, I can see it either way for double blind. You can argue single blind. How can you argue single blind? Maybe you can argue single blind. I, I like the randomly assigned, but like you're saying, it's still not blind because I know whether or not I got an ultrasound or not. Yeah. Unless they, like, I don't think it would be a good idea unless they, like, put them under or something. Okay, so it asks for a design improvement, so how are we improving it? Oh, gosh, you do so many things to improve that. That's not how? an experiment. Um, improve this, could, please, and make my life could, a little better. Um, you could take women of similar weight. Because that plays into it, I'm sure. Okay, so select uh, select sample Subject. subjects with a what's that called when we're wanting to not do a simple random sample, but instead we're wanting to think through their their weight. Are we going to call that a cluster? Are we going to call that a stratified random? That sounds more like a cluster to me. Stratified. Unless we're grouping them in. Well, unless we're only having. If we're having just one sample of the one group, I would say cluster. But if we're having multiple samples of multiple different groups, I would say stratified. So wait, but. Yeah, I think it would make the most sense if you have like. You just group them into like based off of weight, and then did the results based off of like. So if she wants to do a cluster with like a. I'm not. I guess I'd be the large person, but like a skinny, medium, large person, skinny, medium, large, yeah. skinny, medium, large. Okay. With a cluster, select some sample subjects with a cluster rather than. I guess cluster group would be better. Rather than a simple. Random sample to take weight into account. I think that was smart that Sally wants to focus, redesign how we select our sample and actually take into consideration the subject's weight. I think that's smart. Yeah.
And you and Hunter are both going to get lots of points for this. Hunter, you can have a point too. Okay, so we've we've changed the sample itself. How are we going to change the experiment? Um, you can assure that the women don't know what the what they're doing with their test. Do not tell subjects, or who else should we not tell? Or ultrasound techs, sound technicians. What you're actually studying, actually wanting to learn. That way they can influence it in any way. So what are we trying to make it by doing this? Yeah. Is there anything else we need to do? You address the lurking variable of weight. We, you, by making a double line, you address the lurking variable of the, the mindset of the mother. There might be premature birth. It could, like it could put into account like pre-existing health conditions. About how you could do that. With no, so select some subjects with no pre-existing health conditions. That's a good thing to add. I like that. So specifically, we're only looking at healthy, normal mothers who, like, I had a miscarriage, so I wouldn't be in this because they, like, monitor me more carefully. If you've had a miscarriage or two, they monitor you a, couple, a little more carefully because they want to try to make sure it doesn't happen again. Um, a miscarriage is kind of, like, genetic. Uh, and then some people won't have them, and some people just will have them more than others. They said it was, like, a one-third chance that people have them anyway. I know a girl who had a normal baby and then the second baby was a miscarriage. Or like they had three babies and then they had a miscarriage. So My it's mom had four. It's supposed to be just a normal part of life. Yeah. yeah. Um, but like my friend on the hall, her miscarriages were due to her uterus is upside down. Yeah. So she had surgery and now they've like fixed that. So like maybe the design. So they, some people it's a chemical and like I know a girl who just had to take a supplement and it fixed her. So I don't know. I have no idea what my deal was. If I did, I, I would fix things, but I can't. How sad. We, we're all miscarriages. Okay, um, ultrasound text. Yeah. Don't tell subjects ultrasound conditions. But there's one more thing, and I think Sally hit on it with the premature birth thing. I think we need to add a clause. No, someone else. Oh, it was Hunter. It was Hunter. And you can have a point for it, but I think we need to add a clause. Some sort of like, we're only going to take results from from those that have like full nine full term birth. Nine. Yeah, only use results <laughs> from full term births. But if we if we don't do use full term births, we have to have some sort of a clause because, like he's saying, like if I gave birth tomorrow, that's gonna be different than my kid when I'm at 40 weeks. Obviously, it'd be a different weight, or else we should be really concerned. Do you think that the prematures could be would be considered outliers if they were like? Well, we just if we them. if we included them, yes, they would be. But but typically, you don't want outliers in your data, right? So right. So you wouldn't include them at all. Yeah, that's what I'm saying. I want to add a clause, like we're only going to use the results from our full-term birth. But then can you argue that we're skewing your data? <sighs> One could, but since we're looking specific, if I may, I guess you could if it weren't for the fact that what we're measuring is the baby's birth weight. And I think everyone can agree that a baby's birth weight is going to be very different if they're born prematurely. Yeah. So that would be like a whole other experience. Yeah, so if we were measuring something else and maybe all births. But since we're doing weight, probably not a good idea. Okay, inference for experiments. An observed effect so large that it would really occur by chance is called statistically significant. So if something happens and it's really important, we call it statistically significant. That's our go-to word, significant. 
Okay, and then here's the other thing you were mad at the other day. So finally, you're going to be unmad. Blocking. Blocking is a group of experimental units that are known before the experiment to be similar in some way that is expected to affect the response to the treatments. So blocking is a group of experimental units that are known before the experiment to be similar in some way that is expected to affect the response to the treatments. And then the next one says a randomized block design is the random assignment of experimental units to treatments is carried out separately within each block. Which honestly, when you read that, you're like, I don't know what that means. But I swear after we work through the next example, it'll be okay. So example 10, Anne is an avid baker who would like to compare two different chocolate chip cookie recipes, A and B. So she recruits 10 volunteer taste testers <laughs> to rate each type of cookie on a scale from 1 to 5. <laughs> I would do that. I know, that's why they said not a hard task. She will make 10 of each type of cookie for a total of 20. Each cookie tray will hold only 10 cookies, so she will use two trays and make them at the same time in the same oven. One sheet on the lower rack and one sheet on the upper rack. Explain why a randomized block design might be preferable to a completely randomized design for this experiment. Okay, so a block is the random assignment of experimental units two treatments is carried out. So thinking about her cookie baking. Each tray can only hold two cookie, 10 cookies. She will use two trays and bake them at the same time in the same oven. But they're on different Right. But they're on different levels of the oven. Does that affect the if cookie the, quality? If it's like if it's like a regular oven and it's just like top, yeah, top heater the thing. The top is going to be more cooked, but if you go on the bottom, bottom there is, might be more burned. So yeah. there is potential difference between the two cookie sheets. In the softness of the cookies. Yes. Yeah, so. I think we should just assume that's not going to happen because the, I think she's trying to compare the three recipes and not. The actual product. But it is like a lucky variable. variable. I mean, like. It is a lucky variable that it takes you take into account, right? Right. So how are we going to fix this? That's why they're wanting to do some sort of a block design. That way, what you're saying isn't part of the issue, yeah, and they're literally just measuring oh, the two pieces. Why not have half and half on each tray? What I'm saying is, you could block it down to, you have, let's say, there's how many cookie recipes are there? There are two recipes, 20 cookies total. Okay. So you could do like um, 10 blocks where you have like, I assume this works out, like one gooey version and one normal baked version, and then one gooey version and one normal baked version for the box so that people can Are you talking about it. putting on the different racks? All things, so that way people can taste, instead of comparing like the texture, which does things, because you can like, compare the texture. Yeah, you can 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 compare the texture. Okay, so what I'm thinking, I, I'm on his same rant, but I'm still focused on what Sally said about and what, what we're discussing about the heating levels. So maybe I put half a recipe one on the top, half a recipe one on the bottom. So I've got... But different people are going to receive different ones. Right. And so like uh, different people have different preferences and... So why don't I have, so, there are 10 volunteers, why don't I have five volunteers only it. taste the ones from the top rack, both recipes, and the other five volunteers only taste from the bottom rack, both recipes? Well, that makes sense. Because then, like, yes, the bottom rack was probably harder than the top rack or whatever you want to argue, because I think their bottoms would be darker, but if their bottoms are darker, it's for both recipes. So that's what I think when I read randomized block design, that's what I read. Of Is there some way we can make it more even and kill off a lurking variable? with, before, But not dealing with selecting our sample, dealing with how we're doing our experiment. So explain why randomized block design might be preferable. I guess I would argue um, cookie quality. This is my kind of experience. Yeah. And it's my kind too, based on oven rack, oven rack tip. Uh, I'm telling you, there are different ones in college you can try. And then they asked us to outline a randomized block design, so I think what we've drawn above is sufficient. Of like, first five volunteers, just assign them, you're from rack one only to taste both recipes. Five volunteers, you're from rack two only to taste both recipes. That way, poor second rack people. Both theirs are darker, but at least it's for both recipes. And then we're actually yeah. measuring the quality of the recipes, not how dark our cookie is compared to the one on the top upper rack. Okay, so 
the last little thing, and we're not doing the activity, it's called a match pairs design. And it's a common type of randomized block design for comparing two treatments. So, uh, and then the example I remember from an old AP test is they were wanting to measure um, how this medicine was affecting some dogs. So they, they split up dogs by their weight and by their age. So like they did their sample and their sample was random, but then based off what your weight was and your age was, that's when you were placed in a certain group. So match pair meaning like all the small young dogs, we measured their results, whereas all the fat old dogs are in a separate group and we measured their results. Well, they're also different breeds. That's the part there, right? And they argued that too about the different lengths. So, I mean, you could do match pairs implies two things, but, I mean, I guess you could try to block it even further. Small, young. I guess they thought small weight also meant small that size. Breeds. Oh, it would that not go into size? I'm saying, like, do different breeds have different, like, health conditions? Like, like for example, like... all the same breed. Yeah, for, this, yeah. The, for the one that they were doing it was. Oh, they were all the same breed? I believe so. I have to pull it up and see. I don't know. Sure, I believe so. Important. But anyway, so a match pair is just like be even more specific of yes, we understand a small skinny dog is gonna be affected differently than an older chunkier dog. Like yeah, we got it. So we need to put them in separate things. We got it. Cool. Okay. Last thing, and I'm done talking and rambling at you. Using studies wisely. Yes, dear. Okay, so the whole point of all of this, of setting up our sample, running our experiment, is so that we can make some sort of a <coughs> an inference about the population as a whole. And it requires that the individuals taking part in a study must be randomly selected from the larger population. A well-designed experimental that random experiment that randomly assigns treatments to experimental units allows inference about cause and effect. Okay, we all know this, but if we are not realistic with our experiment, then obviously we can't use the results. Um, like in that ultrasound one, because Hunter is like, could we do a fake ultrasound? Obviously that's not realistic. I feel like that's not feasible. Okay, so if, and this is back to, we're never gonna use that word causation. If you can't do an experiment, actually proving causation requires a strong association that appears consistently in many studies, a clear explanation for the alleged cause Casual link and careful examination of possible lurking variables. Casual? 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 Causal. Is it causal? Careful. Causal link. No, before that though. Causal. Cash. Causal. Why did I say casual? I would have written it as casual too because it was Causal like, link. Yeah. Those letters. English is so yeah. dumb. I didn't know that was a word. I don't know, English is so dumb. So basically, if you can't do an experiment, it's really hard to prove causation. Um, yes, I don't know who came, why did I, in my brain, okay, cool. Okay, and this is the other cool thing I can actually uh, say something about. So when I was in grad school for my master's in math, I had to write a paper. And we decided what I was going to do is an observational study where I went and sat in other people's classrooms and I observed their behaviors and how their kids interacted and what questions they asked. Did they seem interested? Didn't they seem engaged? In fact, we had a whole rating system on it. And so I would fill that out. And of course, I had to be taught how to use the system and we had to do a couple sample lessons with me and this other guy to make sure I was measuring the same as he was. So that way you can't say, oh, well, she's just a different judger than he is or whatever. Anyway. Long story short, for me to use the data that I collected from all these classrooms, I had to first get a review board to approve my, my observational study. And if they don't approve it, which took a while for them to approve it, because you have to prove that you're not messing with people's lives or whatever, um, you have to get it approved. And of course, I had to have the students didn't give me their consent necessarily. The professor gave me their consent, and they told me I was allowed in the classroom at that time. I guess technically when you attend a university, you've kind of been giving your okay for a lot of this to happen to you unintentionally. So that's what happened. 
So, and then, of course, I didn't actually record information about the individual students. I wrote information about the professors themselves, and it remained confidential. So when I typed up my results, I wouldn't put Professor Lyle. I would put, like, Subject 201, like we had a numbering system. Yeah, so we had a... We had a numbering system. That way you wouldn't know who I had done the observation on. Yeah, so it wasn't a good study necessarily because it was voluntary response. So I emailed out everyone of could I come watch. So, so those who didn't want to be watched weren't watched. So only the, the overachievers were watched. Interesting. Could I share with you real quick? Yes. I just tried to take a sip of my drink. The mouthful is that way. I just poured water on my nose. Happens all the time. All the time. <laughs> the other day I forgot to change out my straw top and left it and tried to drink it like normal. Oh, yeah. It was terrible. <laughs> terrible. Okay, so. Yeah, that's my life. <sighs> remember that randomized comparative experiments can answer questions that can't be answered without them. Also remember that the interest of the subject may always prevail over the interest of the science and society. Okay, so basically. The last sentence, remember the interest of the subject may always must always prevail over the interest of science and society. We might want to learn what would happen if I hung you all off the roof just to see. But obviously I can't actually do that because the interests of the subject are more important than the interest of science. What if you're like all for it? You know? If you all science... What if you're like pro that? Well, well, yeah, how far off like the roof? How <laughs> Even if I got your individual consent, there's no way we're going to get this approved by an institutional uh, review board. I mean, the roof's on the school. Is we want to, what is the, yeah, what's the, what's the, at least over here, here it's not. I just want to know how low can I hang Samantha before her heart rate gets above 200? How about how low can you hang 200? Yeah, I just want to know. <laughs> Actually, maybe breath, maybe breath. we should, you know, measure Samantha's normal heart rate, yeah. then make Samantha run for five minutes, see what her heart rate goes up to, and then just make sure I can beat that when I hang her off the roof. Maybe that's my goal. Yeah, that's like 200. Is Max? I don't know what Max is. I don't know what he is. Like healthy is like 120, like 160, like the upper 200 is just like, yeah. Mine's at 104 right now. Mine is at 104 right now. I don't know what my goal is. Okay, so that basically, that's never going to happen. And you're going to say, well, why do we want it approved by a review board? What's the point in going through all this and getting the subjects and making the experiment and actually doing it and getting results? And then you write this giant paper on your results. If you're not actually going to get it published and actually put out there in some sort of journal or magazine or whatever so someone else is out there to read. Yeah, so I, mine actually finally got published. Like, you can, well, my main name's Kofer, so you can find Leah Kofer in, like, a pub, pe published paper on this study, but only because I went through the Institutional Review Board. What if we hadn't gone study? through them, um, nothing that you'd be surprised with. College classes aren't as interested in engaging students as high school classes are. No. I mean, like, nothing monumental. Um, like, 200 people or so. They, uh, they're just really interested in making an observational, you know, because... My, my mom told me I'd never have a professor that knew my name. Probably not. Uh, not unless you make them know your name. Uh, at what school? UAB. Okay, and she do upper level classes? Uh, no, she does, um, like, composition with... Okay, yeah, so she doesn't have, like, the, like, room of 500, you know not what I mean? Not that many. Yeah, so that's <laughs> kind of the difference. So, the thought was... You know when Dr. Hester comes in and randomly just sits in here? Yeah. Like, what is he judging from me at that point? Or from y'all, like y'all's reaction to me. What is he judging? So, and then he writes up something and then puts it on, um, like, Educate Alabama or whatever. So if I ever go to another school system, they can read that. But how are they, they don't know Dr. Hester. How do they know he's legit and what he's saying is actually true? Like, she, she engaged her students or whatever. Yeah, but he might have a skewed vision it's of me or whatever since I am his employee. Yeah. So, <laughs> and we would like for it to be such a good observation that it doesn't matter if it was Dr. Hester, Dr. Vickers, it could be you. It doesn't matter who's filling out the protocol, but such a good protocol that when they fill it out, they all got the same results from the same observation. That's the, that's the theory. So they came up with this math observational protocol, and it, it worked in the high school level. 
And then when we took it to the college level, it failed because college classes are set up differently and they're not as they're bigger and the format's different. So we had to tweak our observational protocol for college. It's nothing monumental or like mind blowing. It was just something to see. Like, hey, is there some way we come up with a set system so no matter who observes you, you get the same results? Which sounds smart for education, but that's not even what they use. So um, what I was doing was called the MCOP, and that's what, so it was specifically a math classroom observational protocol, you know, MCOP, math classroom observational protocol. Um, but there have been many others. There was this RTOP. There were all these other ones that I had to read about how, what they had done, and I had to look at theirs and argue, like, why their points were wrong and why mine was better. I'll just mention bull, but that's not even what they use here. We use a completely different thing. It's, what do they call it? Style. No, it's an Elliot. It's like electronic learning something something, but it's not geared to just specific math teachers. It's very generic to any teacher. But isn't there a difference between watching a math class and watching an English class? Yeah. So shouldn't each department have their own observational forum? Yeah. But that's not what they use. The State Department uses the Elliot. So I don't know. So I don't know why I did two years of that, but I did. I guess so I could tell you what an observational study was like and how hard it was to get institutional review board approval because it was pain. Oh well. Okay, that's the end of my rant. I'm out. I'm not mad anymore. I'm sorry I got mad, but you made me mad, so maybe you're sorry too. Oh well. As is life. <laughs>